Дякую. Дякую. Я хочу представити нашого гостя, котрого багато з вас знає, бо він давніше мешкав в нас в Отаві, і нам дуже приємно, що він знову до нас запустив. Тому що є присутні, які не володіють українською, і тому що ми обіцяли, що ми награємо це в англійській, то я представлю Івана Пангінський. So, um, Professor Ivan Yavorsky is Professor Emeritus of the Department of Political Science at the University of Waterloo, and his research interests include the descent and its legacies in a post-Soviet region. So, he's also worked on uh, regional issues and inter-ethnic relations in Ukraine, uh, including a focus on uh, Crimea and, and the Tatars, and also on civil military uh, relations in Ukraine. He's been a research associate for the Building Democracy in Ukraine and Democratic Education in Ukraine projects. So he's worked on many things, and I, I could really go on uh, at length, but um, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Ivan Yaborsky to speak. Thank you very much. And for those of you who are concerned about, some of you have experiences, I'm sure, with lectures who go on and on and on and on. I will speak for roughly one hour, approximately one hour from, from now. Uh, we'll very gladly respond to any questions you have. I would like to respond um, there's much more I could say. I'm rather nostalgic about this return to Ottawa, which is in a sense my hometown, um, but it won't go on and on about that. Nonetheless, uh, I do want to dedicate my talk, first of all, to the dissidents of Soviet Ukraine, most of whom have now passed away. I had the good fortune to meet in a few cases to get to know uh, a number of them. And among them were occasionally some rather eccentric individuals, but on the whole, they were very fine, honest, and courageous individuals who refused to conform to Soviet norms of behavior, took a public position on sensitive issues, and as a result, were often arrested and imprisoned for their beliefs. Um, but again, usually on such occasions, even, even if they're serious occasions, it's often recommended that you give a light in the atmosphere with a joke, an anecdote of some kind. And fortunately, in the Soviet Union, there were political anecdotes uh, shared among friends, usually, a small circle of friends, on every imaginable topic. So, partly relevant to what I'll be discussing is the following anecdote. Two friends meet, and one tells the other, Did you hear that our good friend Ivan Ivanovich was arrested yesterday? No, the other says. What was he arrested for? Well, you know, he received a 10-year sentence for stating that the Communist Party leader, Brezhnev, was a senile idiot. But it's only a 5-year sentence for slandering the country's leaders. Ah, uh, but they added 5 years for revealing a state secret. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad anecdote, and there are other anecdotes which are relevant, uh, but I won't do too much of that kind of entertainment. Now, many of those who were active in the Ukrainian-Canadian community in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s were keenly aware of the dissident movement in Ukraine and were often involved in one way or another um, in various activities in defense of Ukraine's dissidents. This included demonstrations in front of the Soviet Embassy in Ottawa. I myself participated in some of these demonstrations, signing petitions on behalf of the dissidents, getting involved in Amnesty International or other organizations to defend their interests, etc. For example, the local branch of Amnesty International had as one of its adopted prisoners of conscience Ihor Kalanet, a very interesting dissident poet from Lviv. And uh, my father, for example, got involved in Amnesty International specifically because he wanted to help them with translations and with sending letters and uh, parcels and so on uh, to Kolodets and his relatives. Um, now much of the diaspora interest in the Soviet dissidents quite naturally 
faded away once Ukraine became independent. And there was also some disappointment when it appeared in the 1990s that the now former dissidents would not or could not play a major role on the political scene in Ukraine. But are they now simply a part of Ukraine's history with no present day relevance? I personally think it's now a good time, almost 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, to devote some attention, more attention to their legacy, that is, what they left behind. Now most of these dissidents are no longer with us. Of the more prominent dissidents, Valentin Moroz, prominent, not necessarily popular for a variety of reasons, uh, which I could go into if necessary, but he passed away last summer, Valentin Moroz, for those who uh, don't know. Uh, before that, Levko Lukyanenko also passed away. It was uh, a year or so before Valentin Moroz. These are some names that might be familiar to you, and I could read a much longer list of others who have passed away. Um, I won't continue this, that rather depressing list though, of those who have now left the scene. More surprising, in my opinion, is that some former dissidents are still uh, very active. They include, for example, Miroslav Marinovich, a vice rector of the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and a prominent social commentator. Mustafa Jemilev is still a very respected, probably the most respected, figure in the Crimean Tatar community, and he is a constant presence on Ukraine's political scene. Semen Luzman, not a particularly well known individual, but a very interesting uh, physician and psychiatrist. He is still doing what he can to improve the very atrocious conditions in Ukraine's psychiatric institutions and healthcare institutions in general. And Ivan Zuba, who is now almost 90 years old, recently wrote a long and thoughtful essay about Donbass, his regional homeland. And he was inspired to do that, of course, by the most recent sad developments in eastern Ukraine and Donbass. Now, as a quick aside, it's actually worth noting uh, that quite a few of Ukraine's best known and most prominent dissidents, including not only Ivan Dzyuba, but also Vasil Stus, Ivan Svitlichny, and Nadia Svitlichna, were born and raised in the Donbass region. Again, just wanted to underline that because it's a region which is very often seen as well somehow peripheral to Ukraine and its interests, but again, some of the intellectual heavyweights, if you want to put it that way, of uh, uh, Ukraine's dissident history were from specifically the Donbass region. And there were others, Oleksiy Tehi, there were a number who were from uh, that part of Ukraine. And another quick aside to emphasize the continuing relevance of the dissident topic in Ukraine, and some of you have probably heard about this, one of the most unpleasant and even odious politicians on the present day political stage in Ukraine, uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, had a rather curious and unfortunate, for both him and his clients, dissident connection. Medvedchuk was the state-appointed defense attorney, in quotation marks, because it wasn't much. I, I hope no one, no one here ever has a defense attorney uh, like Medvedchuk. But he was a state-appointed defense attorney for several Ukrainian dissidents, including Vasil Stus, uh, a renowned poet and prominent dissident, during the trial in 1980, which preceded the imprisonment which led to the death of, of Stus. And during this trial, the trial where he acted as defense attorney, Medvedchuk did not make any effort to take advantage of the admittedly limited powers he had. He didn't have all that much room uh, for maneuver, but um, he did essentially nothing significantly to defend his client. What is more, in his closing speech at the trial, Medvedchuk went so far as to state that all of Stus's crimes actually deserved punishment, right? Again, let's hope no one has a defense attorney like, uh, like Medvedchuk. And recently Medvedchuk took a prominent Ukrainian journalist, some of you may have met him when he was in Ottawa recently, Vahtan Kipiani. Um, Medvedchuk recently took Kipiani to court for publishing a book about Stus which provides detailed information about uh, Medvedchuk's role as Stus's defense attorney. But according to Kipiani, uh, 
the additional publicity which this court case launched by Medvedchuk um, has generated actually led to an enormous sales of the book. Well, maybe not enormous, but on the Ukrainian book market, that book is now uh, quite popular, partly because of this so far unsuccessful court case launched by Medvedchuk. Um, and one last aside before I get to the meat of my topic. As you probably know, the issue of Ukrainian political prisoner is now, unfortunately, again a very relevant topic in Ukraine, uh, given the harassment and imprisonment in, in Russia of considerable numbers of Ukrainian citizens, many of them from Crimea, because of their political views and activities, individuals who can very properly be considered political prisoners. As one Crimean Tatar recently noted about one of his colleagues, and I have a special interest in the Crimean Tatars, Osman Arif Memetov is a journalist by vocation who has not seized his work even after his arrest and imprisonment. Osman is a modern example of the dissident movement of Soviet times, end of quote. So this is, you know, one Crimean Tatar commenting about one of his arrested and imprisoned colleagues. But again, before I get to the real meat of my presentation, it's only natural to ask who in fact were the Soviet dissidents. How do we define who was or was not a dissident in the Soviet Union? I'll, sim I'll simply define a Soviet dissident as an individual who not only disagreed with some aspects of official Soviet norms, political norms, religious norms, um, or state norms concerning religion, socioeconomic norms, etc., but who also at some point came into conflict with the Soviet regime, that is the ruling authorities, because of this disagreement. So essentially, and almost paradoxically, it was the Soviet authorities themselves who defined who was a dissident. And this is in a sense an appropriate definition given the Soviet Union's large and powerful repressive apparatus and its constant and usually quite effective monitoring of the population and its activities. In other words, if you were engaging in anti-Soviet activities, usually, almost inevitably over time, the authorities would learn about this and you would encounter certain sanctions. Those who persisted in what uh, was called anti-Soviet activities were, over time, then usually arrested and imprisoned, and they joined the ranks of those who uh, are usually a described as political prisoners or prisoners of conscience. Now, the numbers of such dissidents in post-Stalinist Soviet Ukraine, as I'm only talking about the period after the death of Stalin and especially the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the number of such dissidents in post-Stalinist Soviet Ukraine was relatively limited. It was only a few thousand individuals. And to some, this might seem like a relatively small figure. <coughs> But keep in mind that we're talking here about, again, the period after Stalin's death. After Stalin's death, Soviet repressive policies became much more selective, and their purpose was to discourage and intimidate. You essentially no longer, after the mid-1950s, found the often arbitrary mass repression which was widespread under, under Stalin. I would also include as dissidents, however, all those who were subjected to so-called prophylactic measures. An interesting term, it's a rather strange term, prophylactic, a prophylactic nimiri. Prophylactic literally means intended to prevent disease. It's a medical from, it's a term from medicine. And in the Soviet context, prophylactic measures consisted of various efforts uh, to discourage individuals from engaging in anti-so-called -so anti-Soviet activities. And I could describe what these activities were, but I'm sure you know what I mean here. Usually a prophylactic measure, as it was called, consisted of one or more informal chats with a friendly, in quotation marks, KGB officer who would express concern uh, that a particular individual was straying from the path of being a good Soviet citizen. Those called in for such chats were then usually asked to cooperate with the Soviet authorities, often by informing on others, that is, acting as rats, if you want to use a colloquial term. Um, now, 
many, probably most, of those called in for such chats refused or simply avoided clearly responding to such requests. You could try to ignore the KGB officer and, and uh, their, uh, such requests. In any case, according to at least one estimate, and there aren't that many such estimates, but according to one estimate, during the period following the death of, especially from the 1960s onwards, probably more than half a million Soviet citizens were subjected to such prophylactic measures, and I'd probably at least 150,000 to 200,000 were from Ukraine. That is quite a considerable number, and it helps put in perspective the kind of numbers of people who engaged in and encountered sanctions as a result of their, uh, again, so-called anti-Soviet activities. Now, I've limited time to cover everything I'd like to uh, uh, cover. Thus, I'll focus on just a few issues. And there is no objective way of assessing the importance and the legacy of Ukraine's dissidents. I clearly recognize that. I'm simply presenting my own views on this topic and will gladly you know, entertain questions and comments uh, after, I, after I finish my talk. Um, but I should immediately note that I'm not going to dwell on the importance of Ukraine's dissidents as symbols. Right? We have a, you encounter a lot of talk about all oh, the symbolic importance of the dissidents. Yes, symbols are important, I don't deny that. And in many ways, the best known dissidents from Ukraine did become symbols of courage, of opposition um, to authoritarian rule, etc. And a good example of how the dissidents continue, continued until recently to serve as symbols is the way in which large portraits of Vasil Stus actually adorn some of the tents erected by protesters during the Maidan protests a few years ago. Those who followed those protests might have noticed that you know, a number of tents were put up in the, on this uh, encampment or whatever you want to call it where the protest took place a number of them had large portraits of assistus uh, on them but i feel that we often devote devote far too much attention to symbols rather than trying to understand what lies behind the symbols or the broader significance of seemingly symbolic acts and i think in the diaspora we tend to again maybe overdo the symbols rather than thinking about what lies behind them. Uh, I should also note that the dissidents have very diverse backgrounds and they were not part of a single uh, coherent community. Although they sometimes interacted, several different dissident movements were active in Ukraine. You had nationalists and national democrats, you had members of religious groups not approved by and harassed by the state, you had Jewish activists demanding the right to emigrate, uh, you had those committed to a broad general human rights platform that is without a focus on religion or uh, national rights. You had people agitating for greater workers' rights and complaining about conditions in the workplace. You even had individuals committed to promoting a more genuine form of Marxism. They called themselves true Marxist-Leninists. You know, the Soviet Union is a perversion of true Marxist-Leninism. We have to return to a, some new synthetic form of Marxism-Leninism. And incidentally, I, I was wondering whether to throw this in, but to sort of, there was a very interesting um, fellow from Odessa, of all places, who was a dissident for a while, and then ended up as one of Putin's main advisors. Uh, some of you may have heard the name Gleb Pavlovsky. Gleb Pavlovsky was one of the so-called Grey Cardinals who played an important part in Putin's retinue until he broke with Putin uh, after a few years. But he was one of the main political technologists, as they were called, in Putin's entourage. He's from Odessa. A new form of socialism that would be more appropriate for the Soviet Union and so on and so forth. I'm mentioning that because when we think of dissidents from Ukraine, you normally don't think of people like Gleb Pavlovsky, but he was recognized and, and he's recognized today in Russia, he was a dissident. Um, and he, from, from Odessa of all places. Uh, Odessa, by the way, also had other dissidents, including some well-known ones such as Nina Strakata Karavanska, um, her husband Svetoslav Karavansky, 
Yun Yit Tim Chuk, uh, etc. Uh, now, how active and influential these various groups I've just mentioned were also varied a great deal. But if we look at who was sentenced for political activities or subjected to what I mentioned before as prophylactic measures in Ukraine, as well, and if you look also at the nature and volume of some Vedav or some Izdat materials, some Vedav is Ukrainian term, and the extent of their circulation, it's clear that the largest and most dynamic dissident movement in Ukraine consisted of national democrats and nationalists. And again, you can argue about the difference, but uh, there are some people who identify as nationalists um, don't necessarily place a lot of emphasis in democracy, but you can lump them at least partly together, nationalists and national democrats. Therefore, I will be focusing primarily on that particular dissident community. And when I refer to mainstream dissidents, I'm referring mostly to individuals, largely in Kiev and Lviv, who are active in preparing and circulating some Vedav, and who acted as hubs, as distribution points of sorts, uh, for the collection and circulation of this information. If you want a few names, there are people like Vyacheslav Chornovil, Ivan Svitlichny, and his sister Nadia Svitlichna, Mikhailo Korin, Yevhen Svirstyuk, etc. As a very quick aside, it should be noted that women played a very important role in dissent in Ukraine, but they were usually in the shadows. Some were eventually arrested and imprisoned, but a lot of them did the dirty work of typing up documents, distributing documents. Very often, their role is not properly acknowledged, and I think it, it should be acknowledged more than it normally is, because they played a very important and crucial role uh, in the dissident movement in Ukraine. Now, okay, now we get to the meat of my presentation, um, which is what was their main contribution, at least in my opinion, how and why should we remember them? And I'll try and cover three issues. You could probably uh, think of more, but there are three issues I want to focus on, and I can summarize them quickly as one, history, two, interethnic relations, and three, human rights. Now, what I will explain of course, what I mean here. S to start with the role of what I call the mainstream dissidents in the historical process, that is their importance um, for history and in history. Here I'm primarily interested in the great awareness on the part of many Ukrainian dissidents of the very destructive impact on Ukraine's identity and its future development of the way in which Ukraine's history was treated and essentially distorted in the Soviet Union. Many of Ukraine's dissidents were very concerned about the very great gaps or discontinuities which plagued Ukraine's recent history. They did their best to fill in some of these gaps and thus served as important links between Ukraine's past and present. Now there have been many discontinuities in Ukraine's history going back many, many centuries. But in many ways the most significant discontinuities or gaps for contemporary Ukraine were linked to events that were very much within the living memory of the dissidents or their parents and grandparents. Again, what you hear from your parents and grandparents can be very important in terms of your understanding of history. Um, and in particular, Ukraine had, as I'm sure you all know, a very troubled uh, 20th century. That century included World War I and, and, and the devastating civil war which followed. Much not most, most of the fighting of the so-called civil war in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union took place on Ukrainian territory. Uh, this was followed in the 1930s by a series of purges of Ukraine's elites and the artificial famine now known as Holodomor. And again, I, you know all of this. And in turn, this was followed by the very bloody and traumatic events of World War II and post-war resistance to the imposition of Soviet rule in Western Ukraine. Now, these events had a terrible impact on the overall population, population of Ukraine as well as Ukraine's elites. Now, some who survived these repressive uh, policies fled the Soviet Union, including people like my parents. Those who remained usually became, they had to become very passive and tended to conform, at least on the surface, to prevailing Soviet norms. Because either you conformed or you ended up in the ranks of, 
of the dissidents. Their silence, the silence of those who conformed, was often reflected in the fact that the children and grandchildren of those who survived all these traumas of, of the 20th century often knew little or nothing about what their elders had experienced. It was, in a sense, undesirable and sometimes even dangerous to tell your children or grandchildren what had happened 20, 30, 40 years previously. So this problem of suppressed and repressed historical memories was somewhat less a problem in Western Ukraine where you had memories of post-war resistance to Soviet rule. But it was a very great challenge in the rest of Ukraine, the, the, by far the greater part of Ukraine, where students and young intellectuals after Stalin's death who wanted to take advantage of modest changes for the better under the thaw or relaxation that followed the death of Stalin, they were often remarkably ignorant of Ukraine's history. Again, they were curious, they wanted to know more, but there was very little opportunity to get a handle on um, Ukraine's recent history. Um, but they were also very determined to correct this situation. And uh, some interesting examples. A number of prominent individuals who have been active participants in the dynamic social, political, and cultural life of Soviet Ukraine in the 1920s. And the 1920s was a period, again, of somewhat relaxed uh, Soviet rule in Ukraine. You had a cultural renaissance um, in Soviet Ukraine. Some of these individuals active in the 1920s were then arrested and imprisoned, but some of them survived their imprisonment and soon found themselves surrounded by young enthusiasts eager to learn all they could about their lives and their experiences. Uh, the best known uh, of these survivors is probably, he's a well-known writer, Boris Antonenko Davidovich, uh, who was a writer in the 1920s, was arrested and imprisoned, spent a long time in the Gulag, and who became actually an active part of the dissident community in Kyiv in the 1960s. He signed petitions, he attended court trials, he did all he could in spite of his very poor health and his advanced age to support and communicate with uh, the young, they were called Shisdesyatnike, the new sort of cultural dissidents of, uh, of the 1960s and later. There's another very interesting example, less well known, a woman called uh, Nadia Surovtsova, who became part of the dissident community, oh sorry, Nadia Surovtsova. She had been a senior bureaucrat in the government of the UNR, Ukrainska Narodna Respublika, Ukrainian People's Republic. This was one of the brief-lived governments from the revolutionary period of 1917-18. She had been a senior bureaucrat in the UNR government uh, and then spent almost 30 years imprisoned in the Gulag from 1927 to 1954. After which she lived for another 31 years, Zalizna Starushka, as she was called, uh, in Uman, a relatively small city in, uh, in central Ukraine. But almost all the dissident Shisdesyatnike uh, regularly visited what became known as the Solon Surovtsevoy. Well, Solon referring to this old fashioned term for a place where people meet to discuss topics. But there was a regular stream of visitors to this um, woman, Nadia Surovtseva, who remembered the end of the Tsarist period, the turbulent period of World War I and the UNR, the 1920s, and of course had her own memories from imprisonment in the Gulag. Another interesting example is found in the activities of Les Tanyuk, the founder of the Kata N, Klub Tvorchi Molody, or Club of Creative Youth which played a very important role on Kyiv's cultural scene in the early 1960s. And Tanyuk, a very curious individual, he consistently and persistently tracked down and gathered information from or about those active in the cultural life of uh, Ukraine in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s. He also compiled long lists of those from Ukraine who had been repressed, arrested, imprisoned, and very often shot in the 1930s. And this is all reflected in his almost fanatical devotion to his diaries. He was one of those people who no matter how busy he was, at the end of the day he would 
go to his accommodations or his room, whatever, and he would carefully note down everything that he considered important from the day that had, that had passed. Um, in any case, uh, he started his diaries in 1956 um, and eventually began to publish them in 2003. Uh, they continue to be published after Tanyuk passed away in 2016. And to date, to date, there are more to come, but so far there are 44 thick volumes, each 700 to 800 pages long of his diaries, covering the period 1956 onwards. Um, I'm the very lucky <laughs> owner of, so far, a full set, because even Robart's Library in Toronto doesn't have um, but they're fairly uh, accessible in Ukraine, and I would argue they are a um, truly very important source for studying Ukraine in the 20th century. Um, a person of almost universal interest, he himself was a theater director. Tanyuk has sometimes been described as, quote, the guardian of Ukraine's historical memory. So just as the dissidents of Western Ukraine helped keep alive some of the traditions of this region going back to the interwar period, many dissidents in the rest of Ukraine soon became immersed in the complicated and often tragic history of these territories that is central and eastern Ukraine under Soviet rule. In both cases, the dissidents became very important links between the past and the present. And two separate cohorts of dissidents, mostly from Lviv and Kyiv, or Kyiv and Lviv, actually um, interacted to share their experiences. And I think this is very important as well. Initially, this was a result of frequent contacts between Kyiv and Lviv in the uh, early 60s. For example, many activists from Kyiv regularly spent part of their summers hiking in the Karpaty. Uh, together with friends and, and colleagues from Lviv. This was a very convenient way of getting away from surveillance because it was hard to maintain effective surveillance, you know, on mountain trails in the Karpate. Um, and they also became close friends in the process of, of hiking. You know, those of you who have experience from Plast and so on know what I mean. This kind of experience can be a very um, positive and uniting, uniting force. Um, and, uh, as well, later, um, these contacts between Lviv and Kyiv uh, were the result of joint imprisonment in the so-called corrective labor camps. Um, many political prisoners later, and with great nostalgia actually, referred to the very animated and very interesting discussions in these camps. Because look, once you were imprisoned, you know, well, of course there were punishments, in the camps for again engaging in certain uh, unauthorized activities, but nonetheless you were much freer to speak, communicate with your fellow prisoners once you were in the camps and you were in freedom. Um, there was an interesting term that was used. They used the term malazona to refer to the camp or the camp system. And then you had velika zona. The velika zona was life outside of the camps. In other words, they were saying that you know, you had repression in both situations, uh, but they wanted to underline the difference between the big zone and the small zone, life in the camps and life outside of the camps. And again, another interesting sort of form of continuity with the past was the fact that when these Shisdesatnike, as they were known, the people of the 60s, when they were arrested and imprisoned, they came to the camps and encountered some old Oon Upa veterans who um, had typically 25 year sentences imposed on them in the late 40s and early 50s. So count 25 years forward and you're still in the 60s and 70s and even the early 80s in some cases. Now the Oon Upa veterans who remained imprisoned after Stalin's death, uh, because many were released after Stalin's death, but the ones who were not released were typically those who refused to make any compromises of any kind with the authorities. Because those who were released after Stalin's death usually had to sign a document saying that they would not engage in any further political activities, that they would not in fact talk about their experiences, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying everyone adhered to this, but you had to sign a document of that kind. Some refused on principle to sign 
even that document, although it meant a return to at least the semblance of a normal life, and they were the ones who remained in the, uh, in the camps. Um, and some of them gladly interacted with the new arrivals. They were, in fact, very happy. They thought Ukraine was gone down the gutter, that there was no chance of any kind of revival. And nonetheless, um, these old veterans found that you had a new, new cohorts joint, entering the camps in the early 60s to well, mid-60s onwards. Um, now, um, I'm just trying to argue, I guess, that they were themselves preoccupied with history, trying to fill gaps, trying to fill some of these periods of discontinuity, and for that alone they played an important uh, role. Now some could say that you know, archives are opening up, they have opened up very significantly, especially in Ukraine in recent years, and that you know, all sorts of information is available in the archives. That's only partly true. I think nothing can really substitute for Tanyuk's very meticulous work in the 1960s in tracking down and getting valuable information from survivors of the purges in the 1930s. And in the crucial period just before and after Ukraine's independence, when the dissidents finally had an opportunity to influence society at large, they were often one of the few good sources about important events of the preceding decades. So they you know, served as important sources for those eager to learn more in the late 80s and 90s before uh, archival materials became more available. And of course, apart from their efforts to throw light on events of the past, some of the mainstream dissidents were themselves important historical actors. Now, it's usually emphasized that the former dissidents did not play a prominent role, political role, in post-independent Ukraine. And that is largely true. But I would argue that campaigning in extremely difficult circumstances, it was actually a considerable accomplishment for Vyacheslav Chernovil to come in second place in the presidential elections in Ukraine in 1991. There had been a very active and consistent propaganda campaign to, you know, uh, to denigrate uh, the, these former dissidents who were trying to play a political role. Nonetheless, he managed to get 25% of the popular vote despite this active propaganda campaign. Okay. And actually, in third place was Lovko Lukyanenko, only 5%, but that kind of illustrates a problem among the dissidents that they didn't always coordinate their activities because Chernobyl had wanted to be the, the one candidate from the dissident camp. Lukyanenko said, no, I want to also put my candidacy forward, which proved rather counterproductive. Um, and in Ukraine's parliament, the Verkhovna Rada in the early 1990s, there was a significant faction of former dissidents who did their best to counteract the influence of the old guard communists. And they had, for example, a positive influence on Ukraine's first president, Leonid Krochuk, who paradoxically had earlier been uh, a leading figure in the Communist Party's propaganda activities directed against nationalist and religious deviations, as they were called, in Ukraine. Uh, but Krochuk was a sly Volenyak. The Volenyaki, for some reason, have this reputation for being very kind of adaptable. Um, an, an interesting term, some of you may remember, Krochuk used to be, it was argued that um, uh, he could actually go through a rainstorm without getting wet, because he apparently could maneuver among the raindrops. But um, he got to know and came under a significant influence of former dissidents. You know, not that his record was particularly positive, but uh, they did attempt to play and did play a certain limited role in the early 1990s. Things could have been much worse, I would argue, without their impact. And an interesting contrast is provided by a Slavic country neighboring Ukraine, Belarus. Uh, here, to the best of my knowledge, there was only one lonely and little-known political dissident, or at least one prominent political dissident, in the post-Stalinist history of Soviet Belarus. His name was Mikhas, which is Mikhailo Mikhas Kokobaka, and he appears to have had little or no influence on developments in post-independence Belarus. So the lack of a tradition of political and human rights dissent 
in Belarus is possibly, or I would argue even probably, one of the factors that helps explain why the authoritarian rule of the current leader of Belarus, Alexandra Lukashenko, sometimes known as Batska, Batska meaning father, he's a father figure for many Belarusians. That's one reason I think this lack of a dissent, tradition of dissent, uh, why you have this continuing authoritarian kind of atmosphere in Belarus. And again, that's the first topic I wanted to address. Um, but I want to move on to topic number two, which is interethnic relations. And you may think, well, how is this topic, dissidents, the dissident legacy relevant to interethnic relations? Well, I'll start here with the dissidents and Ukrainian Jewish relations. A number of prominent Ukrainian dissidents had a strong and persistent interest in the troubled history of Ukrainian Jewish relations. Among them was Ivan Zuba, who on a number of occasions, including in 1966, in a very important speech he gave at Baben Yar, cons consistently spoke out against not only anti-Semitism, but all forms of intolerance and xenophobia. Other dissidents with a strong and genuine interest in improving Ukrainian Jewish relations included Yevhen Svirstyuk and Leonid Plyushch. Now, many other Ukrainian dissidents had little knowledge of or interest in Ukrainian Jewish relations, and some were not free of the anti Jewish stereotypes, which are quite widespread in Ukraine, were and are quite widespread in Ukraine. However, again, here the corrective labor camps where they were imprisoned played an unexpectedly important educational role. Quite a few prisoners of conscience in these camps were of Jewish background. Actually, the largest contingent was Ukrainians. There were a lot of Pre-Baltic people from the Baltic republics, um, quite a few Jews, and Russians were actually, well, there were significant numbers of Russians as well, but they were a minority, and uh, uh, they sometimes felt that because uh, you know, the other dissidents would sometimes take out some of their frustrations on them. But uh, many of the uh, pres political prisoners were of Jewish background, and the camp administration tried to take advantage of this in what they considered to be a creative fashion. Each camp, there were only a small number of camps where these political prisoners were held, but each camp had a KGB officer, and the KGB officer, the Opirupol Namochini, would call in one at a time, let's say Jewish prisoners, and say something along the following lines. Why on earth are you engaging in hunger strikes and signing joint petitions together with Ukrainians? Why, you know that Ukrainians are your historical enemies. They're pogromists who over the centuries have slaughtered countless numbers of Jews. Now, that's just an example of the kind of conversation. Then the same KGB officer would have similar conversations with Ukrainian prisoners. Why are you cooperating with and protesting together with Jews in hunger strikes, joint petitions, etc.? You know, after all, that Jews are bloodsuckers who have exploited Ukrainians throughout history. I mean, well, the KGB must have been losing its touch because the manipulation was so blatant that many of these prisoners compared notes, quite understandably, when they returned to the barracks where they, where they lived, and they quickly figured out that the authorities were using a traditional divide et impera, or divide and conquer strategy, right, to pit them against each other. In fact, this was reflected in other ways as well. Some dissidents have commented that, you know, a Russian nationalist might be put in the same cell, partly because the expectation was they would soon be in logger loggerheads with each other, soon be fighting with each other. And usually they managed to somehow work things out, even though they uh, have very different opinions. Um, so on, instead of creating divisions among the political prisoners along ethnic lines, uh, some of these tactics actually consolidated them. And for those interested in the, this topic, the pattern I've described can be found in numerous memoirs uh, written by Soviet political prisoners, including prominent Jewish activists such as Anatoly Sharansky, who describes this, what I've just described. He also describes it in considerable detail. Now, the troubled history of Ukrainian-Jewish relations, as many of you know, still provokes heated debates in Ukraine and in the diaspora. But I would argue that the tradition of Ukrainian-Jewish cooperation in the camps had a significant long-term impact. And I'll give one example. In the late 1980s, when former political prisoners, some newly released from imprisonment, became increasingly active on the political scene in Ukraine, 
they played a significant role in the creation of the umbrella organization, uh, umbrella organization called Ruch, Ruch. And they were keenly aware, partly uh, because of their experiences while in prison, that the still very powerful Communist Party, because we're talking about the late 80s, would actively play the ethnic card against the Ruch by portraying its leadership as intolerant, xenophobic nationalists. Thus, one of Ruch's first priorities was actually the creation of what they called Rada Nacional Naste, the Council of Nationalities, composed of representatives of Ukraine's major ethnic groups. And it attempted to ensure the support of ethnic minorities for Ukraine's independence, and tried to reassure them that they had nothing really to fear from, from the emergence of an independent Ukraine. So again, that camp experience played a significant role, it seems to me, in the creation of this Rada Nacionalna State, which, by the way, eventually fell apart as did Ruch. Ruch did not have a particularly illustrious um, history, at least uh, after a few years. Um, but um, nonetheless, during a very important, even crucial period of state building, and it's when states are first being created that what happens is especially important. Because what happens initially, and I'm talking about the late 80s, early 90s, in terms of the creation of a Ukrainian state, what happens then sets a pattern for the future. It creates precedents which are then sometimes followed, not always, but at least these precedents are and can be very important. Now, by, by, all mean, no, by no means all dissidents in the National Democrat or nationalist camps were enthusiastic advocates of minority rights. Especially in Western Ukraine, a number of former dissidents adhered to some version of a, let's call it a Ukraine for Ukrainians, meaning ethnic Ukrainians, approach that was implicitly intolerant and sometimes even had racist overtones. In other words, I'm not saying that all the dissidents were angels and you know, were in favor of extensive minority rights. Um, in fact, a few former dissidents I met would in public use politically correct rhetoric about the need for good inter-ethnic relations in Ukraine, but in private would express very different and much less tolerant views. Um, but again, the main point I've made was that their cooperation with Jewish political prisoners, Jewish dissidents in the late 80s, early 90s, I think was very significant. Um, and mainstream dissidents such as Ivan Tsuba, Ivan Sursuk, Leonid Plush, I've already mentioned them, remained throughout the post-independence period, although in Plush's case he was uh, living abroad, they were consistent opponents of all forms of intolerance and xenophobia. Another interesting maybe minor uh, but interesting fact is that a very prominent former dissident of Jewish background from Ukraine, Yosef Zisis, became a member of the Ukrainian Helsinki Monitoring Group uh, in the 1970s uh, and is still actually frequently criticized by some Jewish organizations for being overly pro-Ukrainian because he actually uh, sticks up for Ukraine and Ukrainians in context at some Jews feel is inappropriate, but again, these ties were important and significant. Now, the dissident factor, in my opinion, also helps explain the loyalty to Ukraine of the Crimean Tatars. When they began to return to Ukraine in large numbers in the late 1980s, Ukraine's Soviet authorities actually did very little to help or support them. On the contrary, they actually made life very difficult for the Crimean Tatars. And even in the 1990s, there was very little real assistance from the Ukrainian state for the Crimean Tatars who lived in very difficult conditions. Now it's actually not that surprising the Ukrainian state didn't do much for Ukrainians, period. In the 1990s, Ukraine had a, what you could call a kind of dysfunctional state that is a state that didn't operate very well. When I, made, when I once visited Kiev after spending some time in Crimea, I spoke with a senior Ukrainian uh, bureaucrat passed on some of the complaints I heard from Crimean Tatars in Crimea, and his response was, well, why are they, why are they complaining about being neglect, neglected? We're neglecting everyone, it's not just the Crimean Tatars. So, you know, uh, he was brutally honest in a sense about, you know, the fact that the Ukrainian state was not doing much for Ukraine. Uh, 
Ukraine citizens, uh, period. Uh, in any case, but I'm sort of, that's a bit of a diversion. What I'm trying to argue is that the Crimean Tatars, in many respects, had little or no good reason to be particularly loyal to Ukraine. And this is in a context where, where on several occasions, after Ukraine became independent, Russia's authorities actually promised the Crimean Tatars very significant benefits if they supported Russia's claims to Crimea. Um, even in 2014, Mustafa Jamilov, I already mentioned him, was actually, um, overtures were made to him that look, if you agree to support our claims to Crimea, this was just before and after the annexation of Crimea, we'll support you and we'll provide you with certain benefits, right? And he, on principle, refused to even discuss this kind of uh, quid pro quo, this kind of uh, uh, now an infamous term, of course, quid, quo, quid pro quo because of Trump and his activities. Now, one could argue that the loyalty of the Crimean Tatars to Ukraine is partly the result of a very simple strategy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? With Russia perceived as the main historical enemy. But there is another important element here, old ties and friendships that were linked to the dissident experience. During the late 60s and early 70s, the Crimean Tatars actually engaged in the largest, lar in, in protests which were unprecedented in the Soviet Union. Thousands of Crimean Tatars with them were demonstrating in the streets of Uzbekistan, cities like Tushkent, uh, demanding the right to return to Crimea. Thousands. So this was at a time when it was difficult to get more than a handful of dissidents in Moscow to demonstrate on Red Square. This was after the invasion of Czechoslovakia. So this was a very heavily mobilized community. They were actually unique in the Soviet Union in terms of the levels of mobilization among the Crimean Tatars. Um, and during this crucial period when uh, they were engaging in the, these protests, which were again uh, suppressed and uh, many people imprisoned as a result, during this crucial period when they very much needed help and support, the most determined and persistent advocate of the Crimean Tatar cause he lived in Moscow at the time, was a Ukrainian dissident, Petro Rehorenko, very often identified as Pyotr Grigorenko because he lived in Moscow. He was an ethnic Ukrainian, proud of the fact, from Zaporizhia region, spoke, his Ukrainian was rusty because he had lived in Moscow for so many years, but he clearly identified himself as Ukrainian. He later became a member of the Ukrainian Helsinki Monitoring Group, etc. For him, the Crimean Tatar cause became the focus of his human rights activities and his stubborn defense of the Crimean Tatar cause was probably the main reason why he spent a number of very difficult years in psychiatric institutions. He was a victim of what is called punitive psychiatry, that is the use of psychiatry to punish actually mentally normal people. Union Plush was another victim, there were a number of these dissidents who were placed considered to be mentally ill, or it was argued they were mentally ill and they were placed in psychiatric institutions. Now, um, many years afterwards, in the 1990s and later, even well after Rehorenko's death, and I saw this myself when I visited Crimea, the Crimean Tatars continued to honor his memory. There were streets named after Rehorenko, there was a buse, a small statue to Rehorenko in Sinferopi, it was destroyed soon after the unfortunate events of the annexation of Crimea. And they truly turned him into a figurehead of sorts um, and were extremely loyal to his memory. Uh, at the same time, they also established important links to other Ukrainian uh, dissidents, uh, such as Vyacheslav Chernobyl, who had a very good relationship with uh, Mustafa Jemilov. Now, you can argue that, you know, how important the long-term impacts of the activities of individuals such as Hedeorenko are, right? Now passed away, how long will memories of his activities uh, prevail? Nonetheless, um, these things do have an impact. Again, the precedents set at a certain period in time have lasting consequences. I'm trying to think there's a political science term, um, path, path dependency. Uh, the way in which things develop at a certain point in time 
often have long-term consequences simply because of inertia. People continue acting in the same way as they were acted be beforehand, partly because of, of inertia. And some of the precedents set by the dissidents in their activities in the 60s, 70s, and 80s continue to have an impact to this day. I've tried to provide a few examples in the area of inter-ethnic uh, relations. And remember, Mustafa Jemilov is still alive, and he is still the leading figure in the Crimean Tatar community. Now, and I'm probably beginning to run out of time, I want to move on to the third topic, uh, which is Ukraine's dissidents and human rights. And if you need any help with putting things, slotting the video thing, or is you okay? okay? Now, it took some time for Ukraine's dissidents to become acquainted with the theory and practice of human rights uh, in their non-Soviet interpretation. This was not surprising given the isolation of Ukraine, and for that matter, the entire Soviet Union from the outside world, especially prior to Stalin's death, and even to a large extent after Stalin's death. Uh, the first dissident activities in Western Ukraine largely consisted of the creation of small semi-conspiratorial or conspiratorial groups that generally followed the traditions of Oun Upa, um, and which did not stress human rights issues. That was not one of the priorities within UN, uh, UPA. Although these conspiratorial groups created in Western Ukraine after World War II and after even Stalin's death, largely rejected violence as a means of achieving their aims. And I'm talking specifically about 1956. There were attempts to set up small conspiratorial groups in Western Ukraine, but they partly modeled themselves on the on Oonupa, even if they rejected violence. And again, human rights was not a priority for them. Um, outside of Western Ukraine, the emphasis of the first dissidents in Kyiv, for example, the Shizdesyathnike, was on cultural and national rights, especially language rights, the problem of Russification, etc., rather than you know, general or more abstract human rights. But here one aspect of Soviet official human rights rhetoric did prove quite useful to the dissidents. In the Soviet Union, you had a strong and consistent critique of Western colonialism, right? US imperialism, you know, all the inequities of the British Empire, etc. Um, and that could very creatively be transformed in the critique of, guess what, Soviet and Russian imperialism, right? Or colonialism, which is what Ivan Zyuba did, in fact. Uh, in his important work titled Internationalism or Russification. Um, now, prior to 1960, how did information about developments in Ukraine reach the West? One very important um, channel was through Eastern Europe, especially Poland and Czechoslovakia. And these countries served as major channels for passing some Vidava materials on to the West. This changed, however, after 1968, the Warsaw Pact invasion of Czechoslovakia, where Western embassies and journalists became an alternative route for passing some Vidav materials on to the West. Uh, at that time, Ukraine's mainstream dissidents began to cooperate more actively with the Moscow dissidents, who had greater access to information from the West, and who were generally advocates of a more universalist human rights approach. And this had a significant impact on the thinking and activities of Ukraine's dissidents, who began to consistently use human rights language, human rights rhetoric, human rights tactics to legitimize their activities. Now, there was no single response in Ukraine to the issue of human rights. Many dissidents in Western Ukraine approached human rights in an instrumental fashion, as they provided a convenient means of promoting a national or religious rights agenda. In other words, yes, human rights are fine, we'll use human rights to promote our specific, again, national or nationalist or religious rights uh, agendas. In Kyiv, adopting a more meaningful human rights approach, I think, came quite naturally to the more, to more thoughtful individuals such as Yevhen Svetostyuk, Ivan Svetlichny, and a person I haven't mentioned, uh, the philosopher Vasily Sove, someone I got to know quite well. But whatever their initial approach to this issue, the corrective labor camps again served an important role as universities of sorts. Because some of the dissidents actually called them. These were 
more valuable universities than the regular universities. We learned more in the camps than we could outside in Soviet society. Uh, there were numerous interactions between dissidents from Ukraine and Moscow in the camps, including prominent human rights advocates such as Sergei Kovalyov and Yuri, Kovalyov and Yuri Orlov. And Ukraine's dissidents greatly benefited from these interactions, which provided them with useful insights into the international contexts of human rights activities. And it was mutually beneficial, it's not only Ukrainian dissidents learning. Uh, some Moscow dissidents uh, later wrote that they became aware of the nature and importance of the nationalities issue in the Soviet Union only after detention in the political camps. This is stated very clearly by um, uh, a number of Moscow dissidents um, where, because as I mentioned, in the camps, Ukrainians, Volts, Jews were overrepresented and Russians were underrepresented in terms of their overall percentage of the population. So it was kind of an eye-opening experience for some of these Moscow dissidents to actually spend time in the camps. Relations were not always good. As I said, sometimes Ukrainians, Balts, and others made fun a bit of the Russian dissidents. They could resist, I guess, uh, poking uh, at them a little bit. But on the whole, the relations were quite good. Um, I think the Moscow dissidents didn't always understand what was going on in Ukraine. I think it was easier for them to understand the Baltic states because they were so visibly different. I think that for a lot of Russians, even the dissidents, Ukraine was, you know, they're part of us. They're similar to us and they had difficulty, I think, getting a good handle on, a good grasp of what was happening in Ukraine. Nonetheless, most of the Moscow dissidents and including some very uh, fine people like Lyudmila Alekseyeva, um, Kovalyov, Orlov, uh, actually had very good relations with the Ukrainian dissidents, helped them as much as they could. So, um, as a result, partly of the lab these labor camp experiences, even those dissidents from Ukraine who initially had very little interest in general human rights questions, became aware of their importance. And this was reflected in the um, creation of the Ukrainian Helsinki Monitoring Group, which did everything it could unfortunately with little success, to force the Soviet Union to live up to the, its international human rights obligations. Now, um, and I'm getting close to the end now for those who are getting maybe impatient, but when those who survived the camps, and Stus was unfortunately not the only person to die there, uh, Alexei Tichy uh, was another, there were several very unfortunate, uh, Marchenko, there were several very unfortunate deaths of Ukraine's dissidents in the camps. But though, when those who survived were released um, for the last time in the mid and late 1980s and returned to Ukraine, a few, quite naturally, you know, embittered by their experiences, retreated into their private lives. But they were an exception. The majority of these former dissidents quickly returned to public life, which largely took the form of activity and a new organization they created, the Ukrainska Helsinska, Helsinska Spilka, the Ukrainian Helsinki Union, which was a successor to the Ukrainian Helsinki Monitoring Group. And their work in this Spilka and other organizations reflected a strong interest in the rapidly expanding opportunities for genuine civic activ activism, uh, which emerged in the late 1980s. And their work was increasingly informed by uh, a greater awareness of the importance of human rights. Um, and these activities in turn had a significant impact on public opinion and the overall political scene uh, during this crucial period. The term civil society, has become very popular in the last few decades and the importance of a healthy civil society is often underlined in the literature on democratization. Well, it was the activities of Ukraine's dissidents that were, in fact, the first roots of a civil society in Ukraine. Now, what happened after independence was, in many respects, very depressing. Given the harsh realities of massive corruption, socioeconomic decline, and dirty politics in post-independence Ukraine, it was only natural that many dissidents became disillusioned. Some remained active as individuals, and I mentioned some of their activities earlier in my presentation. Others, quietly and unassumingly, 
took on the role of mentors or teachers for a new generation of activists. The, act, the writer and commentator, some many of you have heard of her, Oksana Zabushko, for example, writes very warmly about the long conversation she had with and the support she received from former dissidents such as Yevhen Sverstyuk and Vasily Sove. And she wasn't the only person to sort of communicate with and learn from uh, the, the former dissidents. But the aging process inevitably took its toll. And the same is true of uh, the former Soviet dissidents in Russia, although I would argue that they had even less of a long-term impact on the political scene than the dissidents in Ukraine. Now, this might seem like the end of my story, but is it the end of the story? I would say no, not quite. And I'd like to end my presentation this evening on a positive note. Um, I've already stressed the important roles of Kyiv and Lviv in the history of dissent in Ukraine. But a third, a third city, for me, now enters the scene. And it's a rather unexpected, probably to many of you, city. It's the city of Kharkiv, which had a small but diverse dissident community from the 1960s onwards. Its activists had a broad interest in a wide range of human rights issues, including general human rights issues, that is, not just language, religion, etc. And in 1992, soon after Ukraine's independence, some of these activists, former dissidents, set up an organization called the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group. It is now, and has been for many years, by far the most active and productive human rights organization in Ukraine. It does enormously good and important work. And it conducts in a very professional fashion the kind of activities that one would expect from such an organization, such as carrying out investigations into individual cases of the violation of human rights, developing human rights education programs, monitoring and analyzing the human rights situation in Ukraine, etc. Um, for example, some of you may be aware of the excellent English language reports on a variety of human rights issues prepared for this Kharkiv organization by a very energetic journalist and commentator, Halya Koinash. And she writes very, well, generally fairly short, but very pithy, very uh, good uh, commentaries on uh, various issues in Ukraine. But I mention this Kharkiv organization not just because of its current human rights activities, although they are very important. Those in charge of this organization, including a fellow called Yevhen Zakharov, who visited Toronto about 10 years ago, have also demoted an enormous amount of time and effort to documenting, in very great detail, the history of dissent in Ukraine. For example, for many years now, a former dissident and political prisoner, another new name, Vasil Ovsienko, together with individuals such as the journalist and historian historian Vahtan Kipiani, who was in Ottawa not too long ago, they have conducted long, detailed, and very insightful interviews with every former dissident they could track down in Ukraine. And they began this in the 1990s, when many more were alive than, unfortunately, are alive today. Over 200 such interviews, and in some cases they are very long, interviews can be found on this organization's website, and many others are in the archives of this Kharkiv uh, Human Rights Protection Group. Thus, Ukraine's former dissidents are not forgotten, and excellent resources are available to those who are interested in their lives and the times in which they lived. And those who would like more information on this topic, I really recommend a website. It's called Virtual Museum, colon, Dissident Movement in Ukraine. There's an English language version and a Ukrainian language version which is a gold mine of information about all aspects of dissent in Soviet Ukraine. Um, in short, the important work of the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group in documenting the history of dissent in Ukraine underlines how it was inspired by the traditions of resistance to arbitrary rule, speaking truth to power, and advancing human rights which were fostered by the dissidents of Soviet Ukraine. These dissidents raised issues beginning in the 1960s, of human dignity, freedom of speech and assembly, etc., which are universal and eternal. They will always be relevant. So, in conclusion, there is much we can learn from the lives and experiences of the dissidents of Soviet Ukraine, 
who have not, in my opinion, unfortunately received the attention they deserve, both in Ukraine and in the diaspora. One positive development uh, was the recent development of a feature film about the life, life and death of the Seustus, but much more along these lines can and should be done to popularize their legacy. Last but not least, even if the economic and socio-political situation in Ukraine improves significantly in the years to come, as many of course hope, uh, many human rights issues, including issues such as gender rights, the rights of invalids, conditions in psychiatric hospitals, etc., um, will remain. Some of these issues were not even addressed by uh, the dissidents of the Soviet period. They simply were not, did, did not appear to be relevant at the time. But by doing their best to aid ordinary citizens today who are being abused in Ukraine's prisons, who are being mistreated by Ukraine's still very corrupt court system, who are being exploited in the workplace where working conditions are sometimes extremely poor, um, and people who are suffering from family violence, etc., by doing their best to aid people who are suffering these abuses, the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group and other similar organizations in Ukraine are providing the dissidents of old who have left or are now leaving the scene with the best possible memorial that I can imagine. The present day human rights activists in Kharkiv and elsewhere were greatly inspired by the dissident, by their dissident predecessors and the work of these activists in my opinion, is the dissident's most important and meaningful legacy. So on that, I hope positive note, uh, that is the end of my presentation. Dean Melkov, I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to thank the professor of the Boris Hutton for your very interesting work. Professor Yavorsk, would it be Mate Pirpinia? Questions are welcome in English as well. So if you have any questions to uh, Professor Yavorsk, please ask. And afterwards, don't run away. We will have coffee and um, uh, cookies. So that will be an uh, opportunity for some informal conversation, too. And I wanted to thank you as well for your attention. And it has been a pleasure speaking to this select but elite audience. Uh, you can consider yourselves the smetanka of the Ukrainian community, the creme de la creme, right? Uh, so, you know, turnout is actually uh, fairly decent, I think, for Ottawa on a cold February evening. Uh, and certainly, I was happy to have this opportunity to speak to you. But questions or comments? Yes. Are you familiar with the name Stepan Khmara? Stepan Khmara. Yes, I am familiar with the name. He was one of many Ukrainian dissidents, and I know that he has a daughter, if I'm not mistaken, living here in uh, uh, Ottawa, but she's not here, I think. Uh, um, he was a rather, maybe it's good she's not here, because he was a rather obstreperous individual. He seemed to readily get into conflicts, not only with the Soviet authorities, but with some of his fellow uh, dissidents. So he was not an easy person, and um, I don't know a lot actually about his biography. Uh, he was the author of one uh, of the Ukrytsky Visnike. This was uh, the main Ukrainian human rights periodical, which uh, began to appear in the early 70s. But you have some controversy over whether uh, his issue should be considered a legitimate version or not, because uh, it differed a bit in tone and contents from other uh, issues of Ukrinsky Visnik, um, and as I said, a, a rather, well, a difficult individual. I'm not saying that necessarily in a very critical sense, but uh, he continues to make waves in Ukraine because he is a perpetual rebel, you know, rebelling against everyone and everything, and sometimes in a way which I feel is a bit inappropriate, but I can say that since his daughter is not is not here. Maybe she would agree with me if she knows her father well. So. And I don't know if that should be included on the tape. But <laughs> no. Too late. Too late, I guess. Okay. I'm retired, so I don't have to care what <laughs> people think about me and my activities. So, next question or comment? Yes. I thought it was pretty on the part of the dissidents in the 60s in 
Russia, for all of policy was being to actually use the, the Soviet constitution against itself and actually forcing the regime to contradict itself mm -hmm. and find itself and basically having to argue alternative alternative facts, if you will, right. to keep away. So it was a very brave thing to do because they knew that the apparatus was going to crush the Netherlands, and yet they still persisted. So I, yeah. I think one of their one of their legacies is just simply the, the bravery of a, a, a form of martyrdom that should inspire activists. Again, in terms of the dynamics of what was going on, I think you have to understand in the early 60s, this was the period of the thaw, this relative relaxation after Stalin's death, and there was an optimism at that time that maybe we can continue pushing the boundaries of freedom further and further in a way which will, you know, result in some form of, you know, true, true democracy. Now that proved to be an illusion, but what happened was, and again, I will use this term, path dependency. Once these people become active, once they begin speaking out, once they're repressed, it's hard for them to go back to the way things were, right? Uh, they want to somehow continue their activities. Um, and until what was called the Zahalny Pogrom, the general pogrom of 1972, a very large and massive wave of arrest which took place at the time, there was still hope and still optimism that maybe somehow we can continue our activities and eventually have an influence. Um, after that, after 1972, this very massive wave of arrest, there was some disillusionment, some discouragement. Um, but Ukrainians have a reputation for being very stubborn people. And um, uh, they continued as much as they could, even though they knew that the uh, result would be uh, imprisonment, especially tragic are the cases of people like Stus, who knew that he was very ill. Marchenko, also very ill, um, and uh, for them, continuing to engage in activities was essentially, uh, it was a death sentence, because this helps explain also the case of Ivan Dzyuba, because Ivan Dzyuba was arrested in 1972. He was detained for over a year, in difficult conditions and under a great deal of pressure and he did agree to write a it wasn't a fully pokayan nazayava that it wasn't a full recantation of his views but he made some compromises with the authorities therefore was not in prison as were many of his colleagues but again the context he was quite ill he had tuberculosis he was a uh, suhata he had he was a, a tb uh, patient. For him, going into the camps again was essentially a death sentence. In addition, um, when you're considering these dissidents and their activities, by engaging in, in anti-Soviet activities, as they were called, you're placing not only yourself, but your friends and relatives in a great deal of confronting them with many problems. So it was actually, in some cases, better if you were a bachelor. You didn't have to worry about your wife or if you were a um, You know, the wife or husband would usually be kicked out of a job. The children would not be provided with access to a higher education. There would be all kinds of constraints placed on the family and family members. Um, and people who were willing to put themselves at risk were not necessarily willing to put their uh, relatives at risk in the same way. And I came across an interesting comment. If you read a lot of these memoirs, you can occasionally come across nuggets. And Zinovi, in, uh, I think it was Zinovi Antoniuk, who wrote, and in a very casual way, you know, oh, why are so people so surprised about what happened to Dzyuba? It was his wife. His wife, Marta Dzyuba, although from Lviv, and a very good staunch Ukrainian, she was very concerned about her husband. She apparently put a lot of pressure on him, saying, look, you know the state of your health, you know what will or probably will happen to you if you're in prison. Please agree to make certain compromises. Now there was a um, there was a cost to that. The cost was he was denounced by many of his fellow dissidents. Um, but he he has made a tremendous contribution to Ukrainian letters, meaning Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian scholarship, uh, over especially the last few decades. I think he has, 
you know, and, and you have to ask the, the question. Um, some of the, not everyone has to become a martyr to the cause. Some people, maybe it's appropriate for them to make compromises. For example, uh, there was another interesting case. Uh, there was a very energetic woman, Oksana Meshko, uh, Kozatska Matya, she was called, because she was a very determined, very stubborn, very determined woman. Uh, she was a woman, the person who approached Vasily Stus to become a member of the Kiev Helsinki Monitoring Group, um, which led to his second and final uh, arrest and imprisonment and death. And some have asked, should she have approached him? He was uh, such a prominent poet, and I'm not an expert in poetry, but he was such a prominent poetry, had so much to contribute, that maybe it would have been appropriate for him to leave the political stage, engage in poetry, make his contribution in that, in that way. And some people have actually strongly criticized her because she knew very well what his prospects were given his state of health. Nonetheless, she approached him, he had the decency to accept her offer, he became a member of the Ukrainian Helsinki Monitoring Group. All members of that group were arrested and imprisoned, although some were allowed to go abroad, a very few, small number. And he died uh, later, and as Vahtan Kipian describes in his book about Stus. Um, you know, these are very difficult uh, sort of decisions and very difficult uh, situations to face. I think Danilo Shumuk, who became a, a close friend to me, uh, said it best when he said, the only people who have the right to criticize or condemn those who broke, that is those who made compromises with the regime, are those who did not make compromises. Others, those who were not arrested and imprisoned and did not know what conditions were like, have no right to criticize and condemn Juma or others like him who made some accommodation, some compromises with the regime. And there are actually remarkably few people like that. Another example was a science fiction writer, uh, Oles Bernik. Uh, he also made his compromise, uh, but he was a rather strange, he was one of the more eccentric figures in uh, Ukrainian descent um, and so on. But we, we certainly in the diaspora had no right to condemn someone like Juba, not knowing about his personal circumstances and not knowing about what might face him if he if he was imprisoned. Yes? Please. How do modern Ukrainians look at those dissidents? What's the sort of what's their image and how um, wide they're you know? Yeah, a lot of them don't know a lot because and I think I didn't maybe emphasize this sufficiently, there hasn't been a great deal done to sort of popularize their legacy or to make it accessible. You know, and I, I remember I met Vahtan Kipiani in, he's by the way, Georgian in the background, it's a typical Georgian name, but he's a good Ukrainian uh, nationalist or national democrat, so he would identify it, I think, as a national democrat. Um, I asked him uh, about this and, uh, you know, look, you need television programs, good documentaries, films, novels even, why not a novel which you know, uh, portrays part of the dissident experience uh, in a fictional fashion, but based on the real life experiences of Ukraine's dissidents. Uh, this is how you develop uh, a traditional legacy. You know, you can popularize things uh, in a variety of ways. Not enough has been done. One of my ambitions, I don't know if I'll accomplish it, is to do this partly for the diaspora. That is, I'd like to popularize the dissident theme um, because I think we have much to learn from it. I also have a bit of an ulterior motive, uh, which is I think there's been a bit too much focus on Oon Upa in terms of its legacy. It's an interesting, important legacy, but it has limited application to the present day, and not all aspects of that legacy are necessarily very positive. Uh, there are some negative aspects to that legacy, and I think the dissident legacy, uh, which is closer in time to the present day, and as I stressed at the end of my presentation in an almost emotional fashion, they raise eternal issues which are always going to be relevant. So their behavior, their um, activities, I think we can learn much more from that than we can from Let's face it, there was a wartime situation, World War II, Oonupa, and especially Upa, because it was a military unit. 
they were operating in certain specific circumstances. You can argue that since Ukraine is in a state of war of sorts uh, in eastern Ukraine, that is with Russia right now, that that tradition does have some relevance, but it's still limited relevance. And I would argue that the dissidents, we have a great deal to learn from them. And um, Vakhtang Kipiani is doing some of this. He's done a lot of television documentaries which focus on the dissident experience. His book has become, in U about Stus, has become a bestseller of sorts. While in Ukraine a bestseller is even a few thousand copies, but um, it's become quite popular. Um, more can, though, and should be done, I would argue, uh, in the way of documentaries, films, novels, short stories, you know, you can continue the list. There are ways of popularizing this, this topic. It could be taught more effectively in the schools. That's another very important thing that can and should be done. I think there is some ritual kind of attention in school programs to this topic, but it's sort of, okay, it's, you know, February the 12th in the afternoon, we'll spend an hour or two discussing this is the dissidents, which, you know, may not be the best way of, again, um, promoting that particular topic, but rather than yes. Kind of building on that last point, uh, so I guess from end of Soviet, uh, end of Soviet Ukraine up to modern day, um, do you think there's been more, for the, I guess, the, the historical memory, um, and including incorporating the dissidents into the history of Ukraine. Uh, has there been active attempts by groups or the state at some point, or is it just not, um, have there been attempts to kind of ignore the history for as long as possible, or is it just kind of not considered as important? Well, again, or? you know, that I partly dealt with that in my previous comments. I mean, the whole issue of historical memory, how it's treated, uh, debated in Ukraine, is remains a contentious uh, issue. Um, again, in the 1990s, it was kind of a chaos, situation of chaos, where the state was almost dysfunctional and actually did very little um, in, in almost any realm, whether it was the economy or <coughs> dealing with history, etc. I think um, civil society groups have an important role to play. The Haiku, this Haiku Human Rights Protection Group, I stress, has done some very good work I, I would hope, I'm not sure, but I think some of their outreach activities include trying to modify school programs to include information about human rights in general, but based partly on the dissident experience. So they've been doing that kind of outreach work. But I can simply repeat that more can and should be done. Um, and this, the role of the state, while the state can uh, support independent filmmakers, um, and there's been more of that in recent years, since 2014. Apparently some documentary films in Ukraine, or more and more documentary films, are gaining, are winning awards, right? Um, I think what has to be avoided is a kind of, let's call it a boilerplate, uh, hurrah patriotic sort of, Ukrainians are always right and the Muscovites are always wrong kind of stuff, which is rather primitive and turns off young people rather than encouraging them. I think you know what I mean. By hurrah patriotism, I mean, you know, my country right or wrong, uh, you know, um, or circle the wagons, defend the cause at all costs, you know. I've never believed in that. I think, actually, that can be very destructive because um, by, I'll give an example, you know, wartime Ukraine. There is a lot uh, written about Ukraine during World War II, which is biased, which is unfortunate in terms of how it describes uh, activities in Ukraine. But that's, some of that criticism is because Ukrainian historians themselves haven't done a very good job of uh, discussing in a realistic fashion what went on in Ukraine during World War II, right? So there is this kind of uh, knee-jerk kind of circle the wagons, defend the cause approach, which makes it easier for those critical of Ukraine history to come in and engage in sometimes almost slanderous statements about what was going on in Ukraine at the time. So I'd argue that good realistic history, which takes into account the very difficult context of Ukraine during World War II, would help neutralize some of the more unjustified criticism which one finds on the part of Western scholars. So that's sort of diverting from the topic. But I'm just saying that, and likewise, I, the dissidents were not saints. Uh, you had 
um, actually in terms of their personal life, some interesting developments in terms of you know, their, their personal activities. Divorces, marriages, I think Chernobyl was married three times if I'm not mistaken. Um, they are human beings and uh, one of my plans is to try and prepare portraits of some of these individuals. Not, not focusing on their words, but treating them as ordinary human beings who um, you know, should be understood as, uh, as human beings. Uh, there were a few who were in a sense almost blameless. It's hard to find anything critical to say about them. Uh, one such individual, I'll just give two examples, Ivan Svitlichny, um, Johann Sverstjuk. Extremely noble individuals who, no matter what you read about them, it's almost invariably very positive. But Chernobyl, more ambiguous, you know, was he a necessarily a great politician? He tended to alienate many people in his entourage and so on and so forth. So I think, um, and let's say if someone someday writes a good novel about some aspect of the dissident experience, it would have to be not a black and white portrayal of them as, you know, blameless heroes, but treating them as human beings faced with difficult and sometimes very troubling dilemmas, making you know, difficult decisions and difficult times uh, and in circumstances which I would hope none of us ever have to, you know, ourselves experience. Sorry, I was kind of rambling there a bit. Yeah, but did you have a follow-up or? Uh, just a short one in terms of uh, like their modern, modern activism, how they're kind of, uh, uh, I guess, mentors to like a new group of activists. Yeah, have, well. Have they gotten any pushback from the state? Uh, but most have now passed, officials? most have passed away. Those who uh, wanted to play a mentor role did. I mentioned in particular Vasilya Sovey, their hands were stuck, their impact on people like uh, Oksana Zabushka, who talks uh, very, very warmly about them, and there were others. Some incidentally played a significant role at the local level. You know, I think the name is Zorian Popadyuk, if I'm not mistaken. He became mayor of, I think it's Stri in Western Ukraine, played a very positive role as a local. You know, not everyone had to be involved in politics at the national level. Um, all tried to make a contribution, some more successfully than, uh, than others, uh, but very few sort of retreated just into private life. A few did, uh, but uh, they, were, they were exceptions to the rule. Um, and as for, well, I keep mentioning the state, I mean, Ukraine has had a very um, bizarre kind of state which you know, neglected to a large extent all of its citizens, not only the dissidents and their legacies. Um, so uh, what the state can do, as I said, is uh, encourage those who have something to say to reach a broader public, whether it's in the form of film, more grants for independent filmmakers, more opportunities for good documentaries on TV. Uh, but Ukraine doesn't even have a good public broadcasting system to date. Um, you know, something like PBS or, or whatever, whatever other equivalent you care to mention. You have Romatske, you know, which partly fulfills that function, but it's only partially doing what it could do if it had more finances and so on and so forth. Um, all kinds of things, creative and imaginative things can be done, theater, productions, etc., which over time could reach a, a broader audience. And educate the educational system, I keep returning to this, where do young people learn about uh, history and about society? It's um, you know through what they learn in school textbooks, and I'm sure that a lot of the stuff that was published in the 90s and later was not particularly good or inspiring. Um, and more can be done to create kind of depictions which will inspire other young people. Um, but the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group really is doing an excellent job. Um, with limited resources. Um, I hope it continues its work. Some of its activists are themselves aging, but uh, they're trying to pass the torch on to, to a younger generation, if you want to use dramatic terms like that. So, any other questions? Or? John? Yes? Is this paper published? Sorry? Is this paper? Actually, I've been approached already by some of you, you may know, Euromaidan Press. Uh, I'll probably publish a, a version, maybe a smaller version of this, maybe later a more academic version. And I, if my health and uh, resources allow, I plan to work in this theme. You know, I was 
I wasn't the most productive scholar. I was doing all sorts of things. Too many different jack of all trades, master of none. I tried to cover too many issues. And when I was cleaning up my office, and I'm a terrible mess, you know, <laughs> typical messy professor, I decided, look, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff in the Ukrainian military. Crimea, still important to me, but I can't cover it the way I'd like to, especially in terms of travel nowadays. So I'm going to focus on the dissidents. And there's an enormous amount of material. I mean, the memoir literature itself, you have almost hundreds of books, either memoirs or biographies or uh, so on, of the dissidents. I'm still, you know, just going through Tanyuk's diaries. I mean, I'm on volume 14 of this 44 volume collection, partly because 700, 800 tiny print pages, you know. And it's not always inspiring region, you know, yes, it's love letters in there and all sorts of other stuff, which I kind of skim through. Um, but uh, there's an enormous uh, amount of literature. There are lots of room for, for good scholarship. Um, and uh, as I said, just go to the website of this, uh, the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group, but they put their dissident-related material under Virtue Museum, something I gave the title during my presentation. But uh, you could spend months just reading the stuff that's uh, on their uh, on their web page. Um, lots of YouTube materials, you know, just going through Vaktan Kipiani's yeah, uh, documentaries, the ones he's produced over quite a few years now. Lots of stuff there. Uh, the archives are opening up, so there's good opportunities to do archival research in Ukraine, although they don't necessarily provide all that many more insights that we can gain from the stuff that's already been published or is being published uh, uh, and so on. But Ukraine, uh, the archives now are much, much more open than in Russia. So it's interesting, scholars uh, of the Soviet Union who want access to good archival materials are flocking to Ukraine because they know they can get access to stuff there that, can, that they would never get access to in Moscow. Now unfortunately a lot of the more sensitive archives which were in Ukraine were taken to Moscow, both in the past and especially uh, um, when Ukraine became independent. So a lot of the KGB files and so on and so forth are more sensitive materials, especially about collaborators, people who are cooperated with the authorities. A lot of that is in, uh, or probably almost all of that is in Moscow. Um, but uh, you have people I'm reading right now, a book written by one of the Shisadisyatnike, who's quite open about uh, and he's trying to expose some of the people who um, collaborated with the authorities, let's say, in the 60s and 70s, and have tried since then to portray themselves as good Ukrainian patriots to trying to cover their tracks. And he says it's important that we know who was who, and that we know who did what, and uh, who suffered as a result. So you have some attempt to uh, clear the books on topics of that kind as, uh, as well. Comments? I think you should approach Oleg Sensov with your dissident huh. file, and he should do it. Yeah, well, Sensov, again, is a very interesting individual. Uh, he's already done a great deal, and he's a filmmaker. Well, apparently, while in prison, he wrote several screenplays for things he wants to produce, and uh, uh, he can make a, a very big and uh, conscious contribution. And although of Russian background and from Crimea, he is now making an intentional effort to speak in Ukrainian as much as possible, though it's probably not easy for him. Uh, a very interesting and very dynamic person. Very much in the dissident tradition. You know, I can see, I know very little about how he may have been uh, influenced by predecessors, but certainly in terms of his behavior, he is well in the tradition of the Soviet Ukrainian dissidents I've been talking about. And I think if you provide it with him with the research that you've done, it oh, would yeah. be perfectly easy. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Again, I see my role as partly a popularizer. I don't have to, you know, prepare stuff for academic journals now in order to get a promotion. I don't have to worry about these things. So I'd like to engage in more in popularization. Uh, that is, um, making things available to a broad, broader audience. Uh, and if someday I'm able to cooperate with someone like him, but I'm sure he has lots of plans and projects on his own. He doesn't need me. I could, I could use his help more than him using my help, I'm sure. Can I suggest that to him? Yeah.
that's neither here nor there, I think, at this point. But, um, yeah, I'd like, you know, if, I'll, I'll, for example, even the talk you gave today, maybe in modified versions, if you know of audiences that are interested, I, I wouldn't mind at all going elsewhere. I've already, I call it the Traveling Jaworski Circus. I've done this in Toronto. I did it yesterday in, in Waterloo. Today, Ottawa. Next, the world, right? Jeez. <laughs> getting megalomaniac here. <laughs> no, why not? It's an important issue, and um, I hope I'm a, a good speaker and can sort of get people thinking about things that they may not have thought of. I guess a typical attitude was, would be, oh, there has been. They were nice people, they were interested people, they were courageous people, we recognize them, they made their contributions, but that, that's history. What I've tried to argue is, no, they're not just history. And even if they were just history, we are supposed to learn from history. We're supposed to learn from what happened in the past. And I think we do have a great deal to learn, probably the tenth time already I've mentioned this, from the dissident experience. Thank you. Maybe I can end on that note. Thank you.